good uh, Wednesday evening. Uh, here we are for another ham radio class. Uh, we're talking about amateur radio here and how to get your, your first license from the FCC uh, to uh, get on the air uh, and transmit and receive and make contacts with other people. Uh, communicate uh, directly from your station uh, without the use of the internet or computers, although you can use computers in ham radio. Uh, uh, any of that. So uh, tonight uh, we're uh, in chapter five, and when I say the chapters, I like to show the book. This is the book that we're using, the American Radio Relay League License Manual, fifth edition. Uh, and tonight we're going to be talking about amateur radio equipment. And we have some uh, folks, it looks like nine folks on uh, YouTube at the moment. And uh, we have ten folks uh, in our uh, Zoom classroom. Uh, so uh, bright and smiley faces there. Does anyone have any questions before we get started on any of the material we've covered so far? I don't so much have a question, but more of a, um... I guess, a side. Yeah. So, oh, I watched that learning how to learn uh, section that you recommended last week. Yes. And the, that gentleman brought up the exam review stuff. Right. I found that to be very beneficial to kind of do like a a brain dump because you can go up chapter by chapter, which was kind of nice. So exactly. <clears throat> so I kind of recommend that if people want to try, excuse me, to try it out. And at the end of tonight, uh, at the end of um, uh, our uh, chapter five presentation, I'm going to introduce you to three websites uh, that I'd like you to know about. Two of those are review sites and one is just kind of more for fun. So um, ham radio related. And so, uh, yeah, but uh, I agree uh, that um, repetition of the material and, and one way to do that is through review and then taking practice tests but the repetition on the material helps you uh, number one to gain confidence you say hey i think i'm getting this i think i know or to find your weaknesses and and know where you need to maybe put a little bit more effort into so it's always good all right thanks jeremy for that comment let's go ahead and get started because we are going to be here for most of the night i'll try to get you out a little bit early um, but we are going to be talking tonight about uh, chapter 5, Amateur Radio Equipment, and we start out with a chapter on modulation. Uh, so we say that RF, you might remember that abbreviation, radio frequency signals of all types. Let me go ahead and turn on my laser pointer here. So right here, radio frequency signals of all types are called RF. And so here's a, a very broad spectrum display um, based on frequency, lower frequency, higher frequencies. And here you've got all sorts of uh, signals. And then you've got the blank spaces when there's no signals. So radio frequency signals of all type called RF. But the radio signals themselves are not the purpose. The purpose is the modulation. Because by modulating a, 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 a sine wave, or a radio frequency carrier, I should say, uh, you add information to that radio wave. Uh, and modulation is adding information. Uh, different types of modulation serve different purposes. The most basic is just turning the radio frequency signal on and off, possibly using a telegraph key. Uh, and by sending it in a pattern that other people know about, uh, say Morse code, international Morse code, then you can communicate. You can send text and numbers. Uh, and uh, so that was how things got started on uh, the, the radio waves. Uh, Morse code, um, was, or we call it CW, continuous wave. Um, we used to say always that CW transmissions were said to go the farthest distance for the amount of power used. But advancements have occurred, and I'll tell you more about that a little later. I think for test purposes they still say this, uh, but there is a new mode that actually uh, goes farther per watt. Um, a CW transmitter emits energy on or about one frequency. So you'd say, well that has got a bandwidth of, you know, zero or maybe one hertz or something, but no. Keying the transmitter on and off just by doing the dots and dashes in Morse code generates a signal that's centered on the transmitter frequency, but it's slightly wider. It has bandwidth. And so here's a look of, here's the, the radio frequency carrier that you're turning on and off. And the act of turning it on and off generates information below 
the radio carrier frequency and above the radio carrier frequency. We're looking here in the frequency domain. It's hard to see there. But there's more information here uh, at the link. For Morse code, for CW, uh, in the amateur radio band, we would say that it has a bandwidth of about 150 hertz. So that's the amount of spectrum space that a Morse code signal would occupy. And to receive it cleanly without noise or without adjacent interference, you'd probably want to set your receiver receive filter to something close to that uh, so that um, you, you get all of the signal but none of the noise or the interference that might be around it. That's a concept, to, to match your receiver bandwidth to the bandwidth uh, of the transmission. So what about voice? Well, amplitude modulation was the first transmission mode to be used. Used uh, Reginald Fessenden was the first one uh, to do it. I think he did it first on a Christmas night and then later on a, a New Year's uh, Eve. Uh, but uh, what we have for this is we have a radio frequency carrier and we have an audio signal, uh, like I'm talking to you here through the microphone, uh, and it changes the amplitude of that radio frequency carrier in time or uh, in concert with the voice modulation signal. So that's amplitude modulation. And if we look at it again in the frequency domain, so here's amplitude versus frequency, you have the radio frequency carrier that we're modulating, and it generates information below the carrier and above the carrier uh, much like uh, the uh, CW signal did, except this is much wider in bandwidth. Uh, in fact, if we look here uh, at the frequency spectrum for AM voice transmissions, here's that frequency of carrier. And we say that voice is like from 300 to 3,000 cycles uh, for uh, telephonic communications. Well, then the lower sideband, or the area below the radio frequency carrier, is going to be about 3,000 cycles. And the area above, or the upper side band, is going to be another 3,000 cycles. So the, the total bandwidth occupied for an AM voice transmission is going to be about 6 kilohertz. So remember we said CW, about 150 hertz. For an AM signal, typically 6 kilohertz. And, and here's another look at it uh, with the carrier frequency. The lower sideband, this is what we call that band of energy, and then an upper sideband, which is a, a band of radiated energy. So this is dual sideband uh, modulated carrier, also known as amplitude modulation. This is still used in the amateur radio uh, spectrum, but what is much more popular, in fact the most popular voice mode, is something called single sideband. So here's audio. Here's our AM modulation with the two sidebands. Well, what happens with single sideband is there's circuits that eliminate one of the sidebands and the radio frequency carrier, leaving just, in this case, the upper sideband, or down here, just the lower sideband. So this is known as single sideband modulation, and this is the most popular type of voice mode uh, modulation on the high frequency bands and also VHF and UHF for long distance uh, work. Another picture just to show you to reinforce here's the AM signal with both side bands. You can actually transmit a signal called double sideband suppressed carrier uh, without the carrier there. That is impossible. In fact, when I used to work for the Voice of America uh, in, in the early days before satellites, this was a way that VOA used to send two program streams to an overseas station. They would send one program stream, let's say in English, on lower sideband, and they'd send another program stream, let's say in Swahili, on the upper sideband. And at the receiver site uh, for the transmitting station, they'd be able to uh, take one or the other and feed them into transmitters for rebroadcast. Here's our single sideband, lower sideband and upper sideband. So single sideband, oops, what's going on here? Here we go. Single sideband uses half of the bandwidth required by an AM signal because you're only using one of the sidebands. So three kilohertz uh, at a maximum 
for a single side bend uh, bandwidth. So remember, Morse code about 150 hertz, AM about 6 kilohertz occupied bandwidth, and single side band about 3 kilohertz of occupied bandwidth. So how do we know to use lower side band or upper side band? Well, by convention and based on original radio design principles, the convention is, and there are exceptions, but the convention is below 9 megahertz, you use lower sideband. So if you're on the 40 meter band, which is 7 megahertz, then voice transmissions on the 40 meter band are going to use lower sideband. If you're on 20 meters or 14 megahertz, you're going to use upper sideband. Anything above 9 megahertz, the convention is to use upper sideband. So I'm emphasizing here the bandwidth of the signals because as an operator, you need to know where your transmitted signal is in the band. You need to watch the band edge, uh, not only uh, of where the entire band is, like for example, the, the very top of the 15 meter band is 21450, uh, but you also need to know where you have authorization to transmit. Uh, in uh, 50 meters, um, te uh, technicians actually only have Morse code privileges, so you couldn't transmit voice here at all, but you need to know about it. Um, and uh, you need to know, are you in the proper sub, sub band or are you in the advanced and extra class portion? That uh, ARRL color chart uh, will show you uh, where those uh, divisions lie, but, lie because, uh, but we have our upper sideband signal of 3 kilohertz bandwidth. Um, we need to keep that in mind. Uh, as we are looking for a clear frequency. Technicians primarily um, operate VHF, UHF. You have full privileges uh, on those bands, and so it's a great place to get started. And on those bands, the, the inexpensive radios like the, uh, let's go over here, the old Baofang. Uh, here's uh, one of the uh, most uh, affordable radios you can find. Um, are they the best radios? No, <laughs> but uh, they're affordable. Uh, these use FM, or frequency modulation. And again, it's a voice mode where you can you know, send and receive voice uh, transmissions. Uh, FM, it's immune to noise, so it uh, sounds the clearest. Uh, and that's why your FM car radio uh, in your car sounds better than the AM uh, in your car, because uh, it's immune to noise. Um, Here's our audio signal. Here's the amplitude modulated signal uh, that we looked at already. Well, this is what a frequency modulated signal looks like. Notice it's full power all the time. Uh, there's no amplitude changes. So when you key up one of these handy talkies like the Baofang, you're transmitting the full output power of that radio all the time. But the frequency of the radio carrier is changing. Higher frequency, then lower frequency, then higher frequency, then lower frequency in concert with the modulating signal. And here's a little bit bigger uh, picture for you to see that. So as the audio signal changes, the frequency, uh, radio carrier frequency of an FM signal will change in step with that. That's frequency modulation. And this too has a bandwidth by doing the, these changes for FM for communications purposes the bandwidth is typically 10 to 15 kilohertz. So remember, we started out with Morse code, 150 hertz. We then went to amplitude modulated signals, which uh, were the, the first time kind of voice signals. Those are about 6 kilohertz wide. Then we uh, determined that we could transmit just one of the side bands and get a signal to the other end. That's about 3 kilohertz wide. And then FM signals. These are much wider. These are 10 to 15 kilohertz of occupied bandwidth. And an interesting impact or effect of uh, frequency modulation uh, here, by the way, is uh, uh, the national calling frequency on 2 meters, 146.52. And let's say we have two stations transmitting on this frequency. The strongest of the two stations is what is going to get through. This has to do with the demodulator uh, circuit in the receiver, the FM receiver. It will capture the modulation of the stronger signal and completely ignore the weaker signal. So um, 
unless they're almost exactly the same signal level, you only typically hear one signal get through on FM. So let's take a look back in time. I don't know how old y'all are. I, I feel ancient because this is from my day. Telephone modems and bulletin board systems. Uh, it used to be that uh, that was the thing with my Commodore 64 or my friend's uh, Texas Instruments. We'd, we'd uh, connect up to a telephone modem and dial in. This is before Internet. And dial into a local a uh, computer that somebody was maintaining as a bulletin board system. And we could send and receive rudimentary emails. Uh, we could look at maybe some articles or, or other things. Very basic. Well, of course, ham radio operators don't want to do it on the telephone. They want to do it on the radio. So back in the day, uh, I remember when I was first licensed uh, uh, back in 1985, when I got my license back, um, that um, this was big, packet radio. Uh, which uses a computer or dumb terminal, that's how old this is, in place of the modem you use something called a terminal node controller. The terminal node controller connects up to a radio, which can be that FM Baofang radio that I showed you earlier. It's something as simple as that, and it goes out to an antenna and out to another station who is maintaining a bulletin board system. Or you can connect direct to another station and have keyboard to keyboard communications. So this is using an FM uh, HT like the one I showed you. So the bandwidth for packet radio is going to be about 10 to 15 kilohertz wide. Same as with the voice mode. And interestingly, in the data communication, which is audio tones, the, you're, you're taking the data, the text in the TNC, converting it to audio tones and going to the radio, uh, it Inside there is all sorts of interesting information, uh, a preamble, um, the data, some uh, cyclic redundancy checks to see if there's any errors, uh, and you'll get acknowledgement from the other station. Did I receive it okay, or did I not receive it okay? We'll talk more about this here in a little bit, but I wanted you to know about Packet Radio, which is still out there, still exists, and actually has transformed into something called APRS, Automatic Position Recording System. We'll talk more about that. So a second cousin of frequency modulation is phase modulation. Uh, and it's a type of frequency modulation. In the case of frequency modulation, it's only the audio amplitude that varies the frequency of the modulating signal. But with phase modulation, it's the amplitude and the modulating frequency. Um, lower frequencies, uh, tones, if I talk in a bass voice, doesn't modulate as much as higher frequency tones. Um, so that's phase modulation. Phase modulation and frequency modulation can both be received on the same receiver. But uh, by definition, uh, this is uh, the difference between FM and phase modulation. Another mode is frequency shift keying, which is a digital modulation process that conveys information by changing the relative phase of a carrier signal. Now, you don't have to know this. I, I'm, I'm going to probably explode your mind with some of this information. But you might remember back to that modem that I showed you, that telephone modem. If you remember, they started out at 300 baud. That was the, the fastest you could get. But then, through magic, somehow then you could go to 1200 baud, much faster. And then you could go to 2400 baud. And finally, I think when modems, when I stopped using them, they were up to 56,000 baud. Well, they did that not by changing the audio tones that were going over the telephone system, because you couldn't, but they moved to phase shift keying and to different um, modes that essentially speeded up uh, the communication. Just an introduction there. Here's another old time uh, signal that is still being used, frequency shift keying, which is used for radio teletype. Uh, teletype uh, is what the news services uh, used to send out, UPI and AP, to all of the, the stations, uh, radio and television, and uh, news readers would go back to the, the clattering teletype machine and rip the, the news copy off and take it into the studio, called rip and read, uh, and give you the latest news. Well, 
It was adapted to radio as well, and through the use of um, a signal that would jump between one frequency and another, called the mark and the space, going back and forth and back and forth, frequency shift keying uh, is another form of modulation that you can use on the radio uh, to send information, in this case text. So just to review, we say that Morse code goes to the farthest for the power that is used, <laughs> although a new mode, FT8, challenges this right now. We'll talk more about that. Single sideband is the voice mode that goes the farthest. It requires the least amount of power to, to get out to a distance. There are digital uh, voice modes now, uh, primarily on VHF, UHF. We won't talk uh, much about them. FM has the clearest voice quality. Uh, all of these modes, FM, PSK, FSK, and digital can transmit text files. And Packet, uh, that old uh, system like the BBS, uses FM on VHF and UHF frequencies. Amateur radio uses the same technology that we used to receive television uh, on here in the United States. Amateur fast scan television. Uh, this was the standard NTSC, uh, which is the National Television Systems Committee. They're the ones that d devised the standard. And I used to work in uh, television engineering, and we engineers used to call it never twice the same color because <laughs> it was a little fiddly. Uh, but it's used by amateurs in the UHF bands and above. Interestingly, it uses AM modulation, but part of the lower sideband, remember we say the, a lower sideband and an upper sideband, but part of the lower is suppressed using television. Also in broadcast TV, it was the same way. That's why it was called a vestigial sideband transmission, because there was only a vestige of the lower sideband. An amateur television signal occupies 6 megahertz of bandwidth. That's a lot. Um, so, uh, whereas we were talking about for voice, for single sideband, 3 kilohertz, here's a, a TV signal. Here's, here's the radio frequency carrier. Here is the upper sideband. Here is the lower sideband. A total of about 6 megahertz of bandwidth being occupied. So I know there's a lot of disparate stuff there, but they all lead to questions from section 5.1. So put on your thinking caps here and let's uh, see what, what we've got. So which of the following is a form of amplitude modulation? C. I heard C, single sideband, and that would be correct because it's, uh, remember with AM you have two sidebands and that carrier, but this also is an amplitude modulated signal just without the carrier and the, the other sideband. Yep. So what type of modulation is commonly used for VHF packet radio transmissions? That inexpensive handy talkie can do it. A. Yep, A, FM. Or phase modulation could be used, but FM is primarily used. Which type of voice mode is often used for long distance, weak signal contacts on the VHF and UHF bands? We said for weak signal, we're always going to use this mode. Single sideband. Single sideband. Yes, single sideband goes the farthest as far as the voice modes. So which type of modulation is commonly used for VHF and UHF voice repeaters? E. You can use the little handy talkies, which are FM, or again, phase modulation. But FM is primarily used. Which of the following types of signal has the narrowest bandwidth of all of these? C. Yep, C. CW or Morse code. So which sideband is normally used for 10 meter HF, VHF, and UHF single sideband communications? So remember the rule? Upper sideband. So it's above 9 megahertz. That's the rule. So it's going to be upper sideband. And what is a characteristic of single sideband compared to FM? 
Mm-hmm. They have narrower bandwidth. Right. Single sideband signals are about 3 kilohertz wide, whereas FM signals are about 10 to 15 kilohertz wide, two to three times as wide. Three to four times as wide. So what is the approximate bandwidth of a typical single sideband voice signal, I just told you. Single sideband is kilohertz. three kilohertz. And what is the approximate bandwidth of a VHF repeater FM voice signal? Ten to fifteen. Ten to fifteen kilohertz. Yes, indeed. And what is the approximate bandwidth of AM fast scan TV transmissions? About six megahertz. Uh, about six megahertz. Don't leave the units off. Yeah, but you're right. And they'll sometimes put tricky answers. It'll say six, and then it'll have kilohertz behind it. You don't want that. It's not in this question, but there are distractors like that. So what is the approximate bandwidth required to transmit a CW signal? E 150 hertz. Just, yep, just the act of turning the carrier on and off at a Morse code rate, you'll occupy about 150 hertz. And which of the following is a disadvantage of FM compared with single sideband? Only one signal can be received at a time. That is correct. Because of that, what I call the capture effect of the receiver, it'll capture the strongest signal and ignore any uh, any weaker signals. So what is CW? Uh, Morse code. E. Another name for Morse code. Absolutely. You're doing great. All right. Moving on to transmitters and receivers. Um some of you, you know, maybe have a background in Citizens Band, um, and so you know here's your your common Citizens Band transceiver, uh, which had a knob, and you'd click around to the various channels. Uh, some had push buttons, or more sophisticated than that, but this is an older one. What we have in ham radio is what I call the big knob. This one right here, where we can actually tune to any particular frequency in the band. We are not channelized. There is one exception, but we'll talk about that. Um, but we, uh, we can go QSY, which is a Q signal, means change frequency. We can change our frequency to any of the frequencies we're authorized to transmit on in the particular band. Uh, and so that's one difference between Citizens Band and ham radio. Another uh, difference or similarity is, is squelch controls. They're commonly used with CB radios, and not so much on HF transceivers, but with handy talkies like the, the Baofeng or the Yesus or Kenwoods, you do use squelch. And so uh, I'm just going to grab my Baofeng here. And you may already be familiar with squelch. So. The radio's on, it's, it's listening now uh, to the Caesar's Head repeater, uh, which is uh, probably about uh, 30, 35 miles away from here at the moment, but you don't hear anything. That's because right now the radio is squelched. Uh, the audio is not coming through. But many radios have a, a button where you can disable the squelch, and down here it's the bottom one on the side. You hear that? Do you want to listen to that all day? No! So that's what squelch is all about. Squelch is there so that you can just have the radio on, um, you know, sitting next to you there, and it only activates when a signal comes through. Uh, and the most basic form of squelch is what they call carrier-operated squelch. Uh, just when the radio frequency carrier comes up, then the radio comes open. When the carrier goes down, and then the radio closes up. Uh, so that's that's one form of squelch, uh, and uh, handy talkies use it as you just saw there. Some HF radios also have a squelch control. Uh, it's it's not universal. This is the radio I have in my truck, actually. It's an Alinco uh, high-frequency transceiver, 100 watts. Um, and it is sometimes handy to, to squelch out the background noise there as well. Um, but um, 
This is, as I mentioned, carrier operated squelch. We'll talk about the other modes, uh, other squelch modes here in just a sec. For mobile radios and handy talkies, they're the ones that make the most use of, of squelch. Uh, and uh, these radios are typically two meters, 70 centimeters and up. So carrier operated squelch is the most basic, but there's also something called PL tone. It was Motorola's term that it was private line. Uh, or it's the same thing, uh, it's just called by CTCSS, also known as Tone Squelch. CTCSS is Continuous Tone Coded Squelch System. <laughs> Everybody typically calls it Tone Squelch or PL Tone. And what happens is you actually add a, a sub-audible tone to your transmissions uh, and the receiver at the other end listens for that. And when it hears that, then it will open up. Uh, and and, uh, and then let you hear things. This have this is nice um, because um, especially for radio repeaters, many radio repeaters, uh, if they had carrier operated squelch, just any sort of noise on that frequency would open up the repeater, and everybody's you know radio in their cars or whatnot would would hear that that bloop, and it's just kind of annoying. So they'll add PL squelch or CTCSS tone squelch to the repeater and you have to know what sub audible tone is it that I need to transmit in order to activate that repeater. Well, how do you know? Well, you can talk to somebody in your ham club uh, and they may be able to tell you or you can go to a repeater directory. This is kind of an older one now. I got to get an updated book, but the American Radio Relay League uh, annually uh, publishes a repeater directory of all of the repeaters in the United States. There's also an app for that. Um, Repeater Book is one that comes to mind, uh, but you can find others uh, in your app store for your smartphone uh, that can tell you where, uh, what re repeaters there are in your area and if they use any PL or CTCSS tones. So can you think of a time when you might want to turn the squelch off? Um, you know, you don't want to listen to that static all the time, but if you're trying to hear a really weak signal and you have your thresh, uh, your squelch threshold set up here, then you'll never hear that weak signal. So sometimes you want to turn that down or turn it off uh, in order to be able to hear a signal. But for weak signal reception, sometimes you need to turn off the squelch. So we said that modulation is the process of putting information on a radio carrier. We talked about Morse code. We talked about voice. Well, there are other input devices that are used to provide a source uh, of information for the modulation. Uh, for Morse code, you might have a key, a Morse code key, uh, a, a paddle or a bug, something like this. You can actually send Morse code over a keyboard uh, as well. Or for voice modes, you're going to use you know, microphones of various types. If you're using a paddle like this, this is called an iambic paddle. This is a Bencher BY-1. Um, it's got two paddles here, actually. Uh, and this is connected to a device like this called an electronic keyer. And what this does is interpret um, a... a uh, left push or right push or squeeze into a dot or a dash or an alternate, uh, w the opposite of what you just sent. That's called iambic keying. Uh, and this keyer can interpret all of that and send that to your radio uh, to uh, then send Morse code out on the air. Some radios have this keyer, this iambic keyer, built in to the radio. So you don't need this box just need the iambic paddle. So an electronic keyer, the definition, it's used to enable sending Morse code from a paddle. So I showed you the microphones before and you'd think, okay, well, this is ham radio. Okay, well, uh, I've got my ICOM radio over here and it uses this eight pin connector uh, and I've got an eight pin uh, uh, you know, microphone. And uh, so now I'm gonna go over to my, uh, my buddy's uh, radio, uh, Kenwood. That's got an eight pin connector. I can just plug my, my microphone in and, and everything's gonna work just fine, right? <sighs> no, <laughs> 
there's no standards, unfortunately, uh, in amateur radio. While each manufacturer has their own standards. So you need to be aware of that, that an ICOM microphone won't necessarily directly plug into a Kenwood, even though the connector looks like it's, it's the right one. Uh, so j just be aware of that. Um, you can buy adapters uh, like this guy here uh, that is taking 3.5 millimeter uh, plugs and, and going to an RJ45 connector. It depends on the radio you have and what connectors you, you need. Here's another that converts 8-pin uh, to a standard XLR. Um, all sorts of different adapters. Uh, Heil Audio, um, Bob Heil's company, uh, makes a bunch of these different things for headsets uh, to, to work in various radios. So um, when it comes time to buy a microphone or a headset for your radio and you don't know what you want to do, contact me. <laughs> and I'll, I'll try to help you find uh, the right uh, uh, either device or the right adapter uh, to get things uh, hooked up. Once you get it hooked up, then you need to be aware that too much of a good thing is not good. So, you know, here's with your audio level turned way down and you barely get any signal through. That's not good. Here's a correct audio level with good modulation. But if you have the gain turned up on the microphone too high, what you're going to get is clipping. And, and that's going to give you distortion for the audio signal. So you want to make sure that your microphone gain is set properly. Uh, and you can uh, find out on the air, people will tell you, oh, you're too weak, you're too 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 strong, and you want to be just right, because too much gain will cause distortion. And that's uh, with FM uh, HTs uh, as well as HF transceivers. Now, HF transceivers, I don't know how you are. It can be really confusing for some people uh, with an HF transceiver, but I'm a guy, I'm a button pusher. I like to push buttons. And so more buttons, the better. Uh, so this is the, the thing that you know, kind of turns me on is this is a front panel from uh, an Elecraft uh, K3. And look at all those buttons and knobs. So let me just give you some definitions of some of the things that you'll find on a high frequency transceiver. The big knob, also known as a variable frequency oscillator, that's what sets your operating frequency. HF radios are multi-mode radios, so they can send and receive amplitude modulation, single sideband, Morse code, FM, radio teletype, and other data modes. So most HF transceivers are multi-mode radios, and there may be a selector that, which mode you're going to be using. There are memory channels in these radios, which are memory slots that can hold preset frequencies and mode settings. So that's the fastest way to get to a particular frequency and mode is to store it into memory uh, and uh, then recall it uh, at will. HF transceivers are multi-band radios. Mostly they'll operate from 160 meters, uh, the 160 meter amateur radio band, up to and including six meters. Uh, that's most, most HF radios. Some will even go farther, but they're multi-band radios. They'll work on all sorts of different bands, so you have to select that. And their tuning uh, controls, not only is there the VFO, um, but you might have a second VFO. So you can have one for receive and one for transmit, um, and you can use the, the VFO knob or direct entry on a keypad that's on the front of the radio to change frequencies. So this is a transceiver, and it incorporates the functions of both a radio receiver and a radio transmitter. Uh, and actually, this is a receiver. <laughs> I just looked at it down here. This is a receiver only. But anyway, for receivers, you need to know that sensitivity is the ability to detect a signal. That's called sensitivity. And selectivity is the ability to separate that signal from others that are close in frequency. So these are things that you're going to want to have in your receiver or transceiver when you're trying to receive signals. You want to be able to detect the weak signals and you want to be able to separate them out from others. So that's sensitivity and uh, selectivity. And there are lots of controls on the receivers. The AF gain control, <laughs> AF stands for audio frequency. It's a volume control. Okay, AF control. 
older receivers, very old receivers, might have an IF gain control, which is uh, the intermediate frequency amplifiers. So you don't find that much anymore. You will find IF passband tuning, which allows you to um, add uh, high or low cut uh, filters in or to uh, match the bandwidth of the intermediate frequency on the radio to the signal that you're trying to receive. Remember, 150 hertz for a Morse code signal or 3 kilohertz for a single sideband. I have filters also uh, are there. These are um, actual crystal or mechanical filters with an appropriate bandwidth according to the mode. There's typically a radio frequency gain control, which kind of operates at the, the input end uh, and, and just the, the input uh, uh, coming into the radio. Uh, it operates kind of like the, the audio uh, frequency gain control. There are notch filters that can eliminate uh, heterodynes or squeals or other things. And there's an attenuator which reduces interference from nearby strong signals. And I, I've talked about the, uh, the IF filter and matching your bandwidth to that of the signal uh, that you're trying to hear. Uh, so that receiver filter selection, you want to match the transmitted bandwidth for the best reception. So if you're trying to receive a single sideband signal that's 3 kilohertz wide, but you have your filter set for 500 hertz, which is a Morse code filter, you won't hear very much. It'll sound really distorted and ugly. So you got to match the receiver filter with the transmitted bandwidth of the signal you're trying to receive. <laughs> Old timers will tell you, oh, to hear those weak signals, you must turn automatic gain control off. And when you do that, you go deaf. <laughs> no, you want automatic gain control. Um, and there may be some uh, adjustments there for fast or medium or slow attack times, but an AGC will keep, and here's AGC on this uh, radio, uh, will keep audio at a constant level. So if suddenly on the frequency you're listening on, suddenly a really strong, loud signal comes on that frequency, you're not rendered deaf. AGC. Use it or lose it. So I said you could uh, change the frequency on the radio using the big knob. Uh, there's also a smaller knob literally, uh, that is a fine tuning control for reception, and that's called receiver incremental tuning, or RIT. And so if, for example, you're uh, on a single sideband radio net, uh, and the net meets on a certain particular frequency, and so you have your radio set at that particular frequency, but your buddy Ralph his radio is an old tube type radio and it kind of drifts around. And so while he's transmitting, in order to hear him clearly, you may need to fine tune. And the best way to do it is to fine tune using the RIT control so that your transmit signal will always be on the right frequency, but you can follow his uh, transmitted signal using receiver incremental tuning. Single sideband voice can be made to sound normal if the other guy is transmitting slightly off frequency using receiver incremental tuning. And on a receiver, you're typically going to have an S meter. It may look like this. Uh, this is an analog S meter, uh, but it also may be a digital uh, S meter. But it stands for strength or signal strength. Uh, and it actually typically has a, a S9 signal near the mid part of uh, the uh, uh, meter. And below S9, each one of these marks, here's S8, S7, S6, each one of these represents about 6 dB, or four times difference in signal strength. So a signal here versus a signal here, the one here would be four times stronger than the one here. Um, that's where this comes in. The one S unit is a 6 dB power change. Some radios is not strictly calibrated. Uh, but it is used to receive, uh, to indicate received signal strength. So, hey, your signal is S9 here, means that um, it's, it's you know, taking the meter right to there. Above S9, it's directly in decibels, so it's 10 dB over S9, 20 dB over S9, 30 dB over S9. When you get signals up this strong, you're, you're right close to wherever the transmitted signal is. 
Noise blankers are used in receivers, uh, primarily for mobile applications. Uh, car engines and whatnot with spark plugs and, and ignition systems can generate noise spikes. You may have even heard this on your, your home radio uh, as a car drives by, uh, the pop, 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 pop. Well, a noise blanker is kind of like selective squelch. It finds those spikes and squelches them out. And so here's the, the, the squelching signal. And notice the, the spikes that are up here are absent in the process signal. And this sounds much better and much cleaner. So that's, that's a noise blanker. Most modern solid state and integrated circuit uh, radios do not need these. But older tube type radios probably do need radio frequency preamplifiers. Uh, and this preamplifier, this one is actually a tube type preamplifier. It uses new vistas. It installs between the antenna and the radio receiver to preamplify the signal coming from the antenna before it actually hits the receiver. A lot of uh, older ham radio receivers and transceivers, their sensitivity on the higher bands, 15 megahertz or 15 meters, uh, 10 meters and above. Uh, you needed a preamp in order to dig the signals out of the noise. That's a radio frequency preamplifier. Note, preamplifier is involving a receiver. So transmitter terms on the transmitter side, we talked about the mic gain control and that you want to make sure that it's in the, in the right position so that your signal is properly modulating uh, the radio frequency carrier. There may be speech processor settings uh, such as uh, compression or equalization. The whole purpose of these is to allow your signal uh, to get through uh, at the other end, uh, whereas without processing, it, you might be just noisy and un unintelligible. So processing your signal can help. And then there's a radio frequency power level control. So your 100 watt radio, you could uh, dial down to 50 watts or you could dial it down even to 5 watts, which is considered QRP, or reduced power operation. Some people like to make all their contacts at 5 watts or less. Uh, just a thing with them. You don't have to do it. I don't recommend it for your first contacts, but uh, it's something that can be done. Now, another reason you'd want to turn down the radio frequency power from your 100 watt radio is if you were going to take the output of this uh, transceiver and connect it to a radio frequency power amplifier also known as a linear amplifier, then this increases transmit power. So this is an Elecraft KPA 500, which would take a, a signal from that transceiver at about 30 watts and amplify it up to about 500 watts. So that, that's a good, this is a nice solid state radio, uh, uh, radio frequency amplifier. You can buy them in kit form or fully assembled. Uh, and I used to own one, and, and they're really a beautiful uh, little amplifier. 500 watts is not the legal limit in the United States. 1,500 watts is. So this is a, an intermediate power amplifier, you might say. But um, it, it works very well. Uh, it's lightweight. You can operate it on 120 volts, and, and it's highly recommended. So this is a high-frequency uh, linear amplifier. This will operate from 160 meters up to, I believe, 6 meters. If you want to work UHF and VHF, though, you'll probably be using a power amplifier that looks something like this. They're called power bricks, uh, and um, they'll, they'll take a signal coming from a radio uh, and then uh, take it up to whatever the output power. This is an SR100, so I'm, I'm guessing it's a 100-watt uh, linear amplifier. Well, linear or nonlinear, that's what this switch is all about right here. It's single sideband in the lower position, so that's a linear amplifier. You need that for single sideband signals. But for FM signals, you can actually operate it in class C, uh, a nonlinear operation, and you get more output power. Um, so you'll, there'll be a mode switch on some of the VHF and UHF power bricks uh, that will, will change depending on what uh, type of transmission uh, you're trying to do. And when we're talking about power, I mentioned the, the KPA 500 is a 500 watt uh, amplifier. There I'm talking about peak envelope power. So for amplitude modulated signals, which includes single sideband, we always talk about peak envelope power. Just be aware of that. 
other modes, CW, FM, uh, radio teletype, and data, that is known as continuous power. And uh, if we had that uh, linear amplifier, for example, this is where it would fit in the chain. You might have your transceiver going to the linear amplifier, which could be bypassed, I guess, uh, going through a low-pass filter, uh, a standing wave ratio bridge, maybe an antenna switch, and out to the antenna through an antenna tuner. Now, one thing about using radio frequency power amplifiers, if you overdrive the amplifier, remember I said the transceiver was going to probably send 30 watts to the KPA 500 to get 500 watts out. Well, if you started to send 100 watts out or from your transceiver, that's probably too much for the linear amplifier, and you'll start clipping the peaks of the signal. Uh, you're overdriving the amplifier. It will cause distortion on the signal. It will cause spurious output, output where you don't want it, and output on harmonic frequencies. So if you're on uh, four, uh, 14 megahertz on the 20 meter band, you're probably also putting out on the second harmonic 28 megahertz. You don't want that. So you, you do not want to overdrive uh, a linear amplifier, especially a solid state linear amplifier, because that's how they're damaged. And on a spectrum analyzer, this is what spurious emissions look like. Here's where, here's where you want the signal to be. But oh, look at all these extras that are coming along. That's because this amplifier is being overdriven. And when you're making tests to find out if you're overdriving the amplifier or if you have any of these spurious emissions, you probably don't want to transmit that on the air. You don't want to radiate that from an antenna. So you'll use something known as a dummy load also known as a test antenna, uh, the Heath kit can antenna, <laughs> an antenna in a can. Uh, this won't radiate a signal, or at least they say it won't. Uh, it's got a, a non-inductive 50 ohm resistor in a bath of mineral oil in this paint can. Uh, and you can heat it up with about 1,000 watts uh, and make your tests, and it'll always look like a 50 ohm match. Uh, to the amplifier, and so here's where you can you can make your tests, or you can build your own dummy load again using resistors, non-inductive resistors, uh, to match the impedance that you want to use, 50 ohms uh, typically. Or for handy talkies, you can buy uh, pre-built dummy loads that will just you know, screw into the top of the the handy talkie with various different kinds of connectors. That's a dummy load or a test antenna. Computers and ham radio, boy, there's so many uses of computers. Um, logging contacts, sending and receiving Morse code, digital signals, sending and receiving. Um, I use a, a software-defined radio, so my radio display and control is all via a computer. Um, you can use your antenna analyzer and display it on your computer and save files that way. Um, you can operate remotely over the internet by controlling your station from another location using a computer. And computer sound cards are used for digital modes. Uh, PSK32 is one mode, um, uh, and uh, they convert audio uh, to signals uh, that the computer can, can understand, and vice versa. So um, if your uh, radio does not have a direct connect interface for a computer, you may want to buy one of these devices. This one is a signal link, and this is uh, from West Mountain Radio, a rig blaster. And what these devices do is uh, take audio from the radio and convert it to, to a USB signal that the, the computer can understand. Uh, takes audio to the radio from the computer, and it also will uh, tackle the push-to-talk function, uh, putting the, the radio into the transmit mode. Uh, so you can use these for high frequency digital modes uh, and also for VHF and UHF. Now, modern radios, the more modern radios like this ICOM 7300, which is an excellent radio, note that they have a USB jack here on the back. And this, when you plug in here and connect it up to a computer, the audio interface and everything is built right into the radio. So you don't need any of that, the rig blaster or, or the other. So. Um, the audio interface is built right in. And this radio, great radio, they're on sale right now if you're looking for a radio, uh, and um, they're about $1,000, and uh, 
and uh, it operates from 160 meters up through 6 meters, I believe. But let's say you wanted to operate this radio on 2 meters or on 70 centimeters. Well, how do you do that? Well, you do it with a box like this. This is called a transverter. Uh, it converts both transmit and receive signals from the radio to a different band. So you'd probably operate the ICOM 7300 on the 10 meter band or 28 megahertz and this transverter would take it to 2 meters or 70 centimeters whatever you can buy these in, in different bands this is a transverter Elecraft makes them other uh, manufacturers make them as well I see this is actually a 6 meter transverter but they all look about the same that's a transverter which converts both transmit and receive to a different band than the radio would otherwise normally be able to use Oh, let's do some questions and then we'll take a break. So why should you not set your transmit frequency to be exactly at the edge of an amateur band or sub band? Read these carefully. What do you think? C. C looks good. Actually, they all look good. <laughs> um, to allow for a calibration error in the transmitter frequency display, that, that can happen, especially with older radios, so that the modulation sidebands do not extend beyond the band edge. That's something we, we talk about, that you need to know where your transmitter signal is. And to allow for transmitter frequency drift. Remember that uh, our, our friend Ralph there that had his radio that was drifting all over? Well, yeah, you want to make sure uh, you don't want to be at the edge of a band or a subband. So all of those choices are correct. So what would cause your FM transmission audio to be distorted on voice peaks? See, too loud. You're talking too loudly, or the mic gain might be turned up too high. Uh, and one way you can uh, take care of that is just to back the radio away from your microphone, and yeah. that'll help immediately. So, what is the purpose of a squelch function? Hello. We heard it here tonight. B. Yep, B, it mutes the receiver audio when a signal is not present. Otherwise, you got to hear that rush of noise all the time. You don't want to do that. So what is an electronic keyer? C. C. That's a device that assists in the manual sending of Morse code from a paddle. And what is the effect of excessive microphone gain on single sideband transmissions? Mm -hmm. Too much gain is, is not a good thing because you'll get distorted transmit audio. And which of the following can be used to enter a transceiver's operating frequency? A. A. A VFO knob for sure, that's the big knob, and also some radios have keypads where you can just punch in the numbers. And how is squelch adjusted so that a weak FM signal can be heard? B. No. It, you, you A. Might, um, you, you don't adjust audio level to change. Yeah. It's, yeah <laughs> a, it's a long answer to just turn squelch off. Set the squelch threshold so that the receiver output audio is on all the time. Turn squelch off. Okay. What is a way to enable quick access to a favorite frequency or channel on your transceiver? Wow. Yep, put it in memory. And which of the following controls could be used if the voice pitch of a single sideband signal returning to your CQ call seems too high or too low? Uh, delta. delta. You use the receiver incremental tuner, also sometimes known as a clarifier. And what is the advantage of having multiple receive bandwidth choices on a multi-mode transceiver?
B. You want to match the mode. You want to permit uh, permits noise or interference reduction by selecting a bandwidth matching the mode. And which of the following receiver filter bandwidths provides the best signal to noise ratio for single sideband reception? We've got 500 hertz, 1000 hertz, 2400 hertz, 5000 hertz. We said the sing single sideband is about 3 kilohertz wide, and actually, though, you can get away with a little less. So, yes, whoops, it stuck on me there. C is the correct answer, 2400 hertz. And that's a, that's a filter that you would actually see on a radio. That's a number that you would see. So what is the result of tuning an FM receiver above or below a signal's frequency? What do you think? Didn't specifically say. But think about if you tune your car radio off frequency slightly, distortion. you get distortion of the signal's audio. That's right. So what term describes the ability of a receiver to detect the presence of a signal? B, sensitivity. That's sensitivity. And which term describes the ability of a receiver to discriminate between multiple signals? Selectivity. That's C. selectivity. C. Selectivity. And what device converts the RF input and output of a transceiver to another band? C. C. What device converts the RF input and output of a transceiver to another band? That's C. That's that transverter, that uh, box that we showed you there at the end. And what is the function of a transceiver's PTT input? PTT stands for? Push to talk. Push to talk. And what does that do? B. Yeah, it switches the transceiver from receive to transmit, and you do that by actually grounding one of the lines that's in the, the mic cable. Um, that's PTT. So what is the function of the single sideband CW FM switch on a VHF power amplifier, that power brick? The technical term is that it switches it between linear operation and non-linear operation. The short answer is that it sets the amplifier for proper operation in a selected mode. Single sideband requires linear. CW and FM can be operated in non-linear and you get a little bit more output power. So what device increases the transmitted output power from a transceiver? B. That's an RF power amplifier, or also known as a linear amplifier. So where is an RF preamplifier installed? Between the antenna and receiver? Yeah, preamplifiers are used for receivers, so it's between the antenna and the receiver, mostly old the tube type equipment. And what can you do if you're told your FM handheld or mobile transceiver is over deviating? Delta. Delta. Yep, delta. Uh, over deviating is uh, over modulating or is kind of distorting, so you talk farther away from the microphone. So, what is the primary purpose of a dummy load? Alpha. Yeah, if you're looking for spurious transmissions or things like that, emissions uh, to prevent transmitting signals over the air while you're making those tests. And what does a dummy load consist of? Uh, B. So it's a non-inductive resistor matching the load that you want, like 50 ohms, mounted on or in a heat dissipating device or heat sink. And that is the end of the first section of our a chapter. I applaud you. You're doing great. Let's go ahead and take five minutes. Please get up from your chair, move around, uh, and we'll finish out uh, with the last two sections and the book, and then a the, uh, brief investigation of uh, some websites. So you're doing fine. 
uh, just to keep it up. And let's uh, do an intermission, which I gotta go over here.
guess I gotta fix that. The music runs out a little early. <laughs> but we're back. Uh, gonna head into the second half of uh, chapter five uh, tonight uh, in our book uh, on amateur radio. Glad to have you all along. And next up is digital communications. And you know we're just we're just brushing on the subjects here. Uh, there's so much that we could be talking about. This could be easily a you know semester long class at the college level. You know all of this stuff. But um, we just we're breezing right through. We've got two hours. <laughs> okay, so. We talked about radio teletype before and teletype machines. Here's an, an early uh, teletype machine, uh, all mechanical, uh, all sorts of you know uh, levers and knobs, and um, so this was an electromechanical device. Uh, and we can say that Morse code and radio teletype got their starts as electromechanical devices. But uh, there was an evolution over time, and CW and radio teletype eventually could be sent and received by purely electronic devices. You didn't need those old behemoths uh, uh, that smelled of motor oil, etc. Uh, and today, you know, we can do it pretty much on all our home computers. There's software uh, that can uh, be installed to run uh, Morse code and radio teletype and other modes of digital communication. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. Now, you might remember we talked about packet radio before. Uh, that's kind of the first amateur radio, what I call true digital mode. Uh, I believe it started in around the 1970s. Here is a terminal node controller, and there's more information on the history uh, of packet radio here at the link. Uh, this uh, presentation will be in the handouts. Uh, which will be linked in the description box on the YouTube web page uh, for this video. Um, maybe not tomorrow. Normally I would say by tomorrow, uh, but since I'm traveling to Florida, it might not be till next week, but just FYI. But we'll, we'll get you this information. So, packet radio. It's mostly used on VHF and above because of the bandwidth that it requires. Um, it uses a terminal node controller, uh, that the box that replaced a modem, uh, that connects between a terminal uh, or a computer and a VHF UHF FM transceiver. It uses a protocol called AX25, which was built on a commercial protocol called X.25, but amateur X.25. Uh, included in the payload, the information that it sends is a, a header, a checksum, there's the data that we're sending, and there's also an automatic request. Uh, to resend it if it doesn't get through. Uh, so here we had our dumb terminal, the TNC, uh, a radio of some kind, and, and going out to an antenna. Well, packet radio evolved to the automatic packet reporting system. Some people, including me, say automatic position reporting system. Uh, what this does is it uh, couples a, a packet radio uh, system with a, 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 a transceiver uh, with GPS. And uh, there uses a GPS receiver, which inputs location data uh, to the TNC and radio combination. And this uh, APRS can also transmit short text messages uh, for tactical use, they say, along with position data. And you can actually track this on a website, APRS.FI. Uh, you can go there and look, and you'll see ham radio operators identified by their call sign. Uh, and here's in the Greenville, uh, South Carolina area. There's Dave, W4DJW. He was uh, out and about. Uh, and you, you can see as they're driving around, if they have APRS on uh, in their car, you can follow their, their you know, route and where, where they're going. Or if they're coming over to your house, you know how long you've got before you, you've got to open the door. So that's APRS, uh, an evolution of a packet radio. Another uh, digital mode uh, is uh, email that we use pretty much every day. And you can send email via amateur radio using the WinLink system. Uh, there's a lot more information here at this website. Uh, WinLink uh, is available on high frequencies and VHF, UHF, and utilizes gateway stations, which are radio stations that will receive uh, information from your station, for example, and then connect it to the public internet. So this is WinLink. It's a global radio email system. Digital modes on the high frequency bands, the high frequencies are between 3 and 30 megahertz, 
Data modes are limited to 300 baud, uh, the very slowest rate, remember, we talked about modems, and uses an 8-bit code called ASCII, uh, which is a standardized code. Radio teletype uses an even older standardized code uh, called the Baudot code, which uses 5 bits uh, to convey text information. There's PACTOR, which is a packet uh, radio over uh, uh, packet uh, over radio, um, uses a frequency shift keying and has automatic repeat requests. Uh, this is on the high frequency bands. We talked about WinLink and, and Windows messaging over radio. And then there's PSK31, which is a keyboard to keyboard mode, which is not popular or as popular as it once was. Um, all of these are digital modes that can be used on the high frequency bands. What you hear now, like it or not, is this. FT8. Joe Taylor uh, was the inventor or one of the, the co-inventors of uh, FT8. Uh, it uses free software that you can download uh, called WSJTX. Uh, and there's actually a suite of modes. There's a mode button up here, uh, FT8, FT4, Whisper, a bunch of different things uh, is included in this software. But FT8 is the big one. Uh, and uh, you, here's the website you can go to. Princeton, like the college, uh, is, is where Joe Taylor is uh, on the staff there. Uh, and uh, you can download the latest version of WSJTX. Uh, and it was originally used for Earth, Moon, Earth uh, transmissions using a mode called JT65. That's in that suite. I talked about Whisper. That's a propagation checking software that's also included. FT8. There's also Meteor Scatter and other, other modes uh, that's uh, inside the software. So FT8, F is for Steve Frank, K9AN. T is for Joe Taylor, K1JT, the co-developers. I believe there was also a British ham, but I don't have his information here. Uh, 8 is for the 8 frequency shift keying format that it uses. It occupies just 50 hertz of bandwidth. Remember I said that a Morse code signal is 150 hertz? So 50 hertz, this is, this is you know, a third of what a Morse code signal might uh, use. And using the power of the computer and the power of the computer over time, FT8 is what we call a weak signal mode that can hear barely audible or even audible inaudible signals that you can't hear by listening. So there are standardized frequencies that you can go to uh, that are uh, set aside for FT8. Uh, and you might not hear any signals, but if you fire up the software, all of a sudden you'll see signals coming right in. It uses the power of the computer to dig into the noise and pull signals out. It's great for low power, distant station contacts. And there comes the rub for the old time hams. It's a contact, not a conversation. FT8, all you do is you send your call sign and your maidenhead coordinates where you're located and a signal strength report. And the other station will send you the same information back. And when it's confirmed, boom, you've made a contact. There's no way for you to talk to the other ham, though, either on the keyboard or uh, there's no way for you uh, to converse in text. And some people, you're supposed to be at your radio and, and in control. Well, some people have gone to the automatic mode. And here's, uh, you know, Charlie Brown. How's FT8 working out for you? And Snoopy says, well, my computer is working Asia right now. <laughs> The old timers don't like FT8. They say it's, it's a contact, not conversation. But okay, it's it's a very popular mode. In uh, digital communications, we have certain terms of art. A bit error rate. Uh, you want to have a very low bit error rate. You want to uh, make sure that all of the data gets through uh, without problems. Um, inside, uh, the way the, the words are coordinated, you can have a parity bit, which is extra data added uh, for error checking. Um, you can have a, in packet radio a digit repeater. Uh, it's a repeater that's used to relay digital communications. It's also known as store and forward. These are also on amateur radio satellites, by the way. There are node stations, which can route data communications to other node stations using the internet. 
and phase shift keying. Uh, PSK phase shift keying 31 was a very popular mode of HF digital communications before FT8. Uh, phase shift keying is used with digital modes. We talked about that earlier. Um, a radio message server is part of the WinLink system. We talked about the global positioning system. You probably have it in your car to get from point A to point B. Uh, there are various, on some of these uh, TNCs and uh, other uh, things, they still use COM ports. The old 9-pin or 15-pin COM ports using the RS-232 serial data protocol. On modern computers, that's been universally replaced with the universal serial bus. But uh, on older ham gear, there's still this. Um, gateway stations, we talked about them. They provide a connection to the Internet. Uh, and uh, bulletin board systems are, are kind of the primitive uh, basis of uh, data communications uh, that we started out with. Did you know that IEEE 802.11, also known as Wi-Fi, the 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi band is also the ham radio 13 meter band. And hams are allowed to modify uh, devices like this uh, and then conduct experimental long range connectivity experiments using an off the shelf uh, router. This is a Linksys with modified software. Uh, you can't use these to connect to the public internet. You can't uh, connect, but you can connect to another ham radio station using these. Uh, and actually, you can actually increase the power. Uh, so the output power of these is uh, 1 watt or 10 watts, I believe it is, um, uh, which is something you can't do on a commercial router. All right, here we go with some questions. Let's see what we remember. So how are the transceiver audio input and output connected to a station configured to operate FT8? If you can remember the software I mentioned. The B. The software is called WSJT-X Weak Signal Joe Taylor. <laughs> That's one of the inventors. So you connect to the audio input and output of a computer running the WSJTX software. And what signals are used in a computer radio interface for digital mode operation? Remember I said there were three things. Uh, let's see. There was receive audio, transmit audio, and PTT, or transmitter keying. And which of the following connections is made between a computer and a transceiver to use computer software when operating digital modes? Charlie? You, you got to think about this for a little bit. Yes, but if you're listening from the transceiver, you want to take the transceiver's speaker output connector and run it to the computer's line input connector. And what is an amateur radio station that connects other amateur stations to the internet? Hey, a, a that's a gateway. And which of the following is a digital communications mode? Uh, D, all of them. All of those are packet radio, the original um, one, uh, IEEE 80211, which is Wi-Fi, <laughs> And FT8, all of those are communication, digital communications modes. So what kind of data can be transmitted by APRS? I, I didn't hey, mention all of those. one. All of those, yeah. Some, some TNCs have built-in thermometers uh, to give you uh, weather information. So yes, all of those could be transmitted. So which, which of the following is an application of APRS? And I've been forgetting to spotlight this. I'm sorry. <laughs> Alpha? Alpha. It's providing real-time, they call it tactical, digital communications in conjunction with a map showing the location of stations. So those are the short text messages you can, you can send. So what does the abbreviation PSK mean? Bravo. Phase shift keying. And which of the following is included in packet radio transmissions? Uh, 
B. B. All of those things actually are included. Uh, there's a checksum, uh, there's a header, uh, and then uh, there's a possibility of automatic repeating if, in case of an error. So um, all of those are included in, in that frame um, of, the, of the data. So which of the following operating activities is supported by digital mode software in the WSJTX software suite? Remember I said there's lots of modes in there? What all, do you, of them, all, all of them. All yeah. of them. Yep, all of those. So what is an ARQ transmission system? Automatic request. Charlie? It's an error correction method in which the receiving station detects errors and then sends a request for retransmission. That's what ARQ is all about. So which of the following best describes an amateur radio mesh network? I didn't actually call it that, but that's when you take that Linksys router. Mm, a. And it's, it's an amateur radio-based data network using commercial Wi-Fi equipment with modified firmware. It's called a mesh network. And what is FT8? B. Yep, B is right. It's because you can detect signals that you physically can't hear. But the software can hear it because it's using the power of the computer. Freaky. All right. <laughs> Last section. Power supplies and batteries. Some ham radio transceivers, I'm talking about HF transceivers, have built-in power supplies. They just plug into 120 volts AC. But most ham radios operate on 12 volts. And so therefore they require a power supply that converts 120 volts AC house current to 12 volts DC at a sufficient current rating uh, for the mode uh, that you're going to be using. So 12 volt, we say they're 12 volt power supplies, but actually... 13.8 volts DC is what outputs from them. Uh, we still call them 12 volt supplies, but 13.8 is, is what you're looking for. There are two kinds of power supplies in common use uh, in ham radio right now. The conventional linear or analog power supplies, which are big and heavy, and switching power supplies, which are lightweight. Um, so, um, for either type, you're gonna for mobile VHF and UHF transceivers that you might want to use at home, for example, uh, you're gonna want to get a 13.8 volt or 12 volt power supply rated at at least 15 amps. That's for VHF UHF. For high frequency transceivers, 100 watt radios, these are typically 50 watt radios. 100 watt radios, you're gonna want 30 amps, 13.8 volts that can provide 30 amps. Of DC power and both of these types are regulated so that the voltage doesn't change uh, it always stays constant at 13.8 volts um, I have both the old linear power supplies analog power supplies I have switching power supplies modern switching power supplies should not generate radio frequency noise but some of the earlier versions did uh, so that's why Purus uh, who want to work weak signals will say get a linear power supply. Whatever you do, buy quality. Don't do what I did. Don't buy what I call cheap Chinese power supplies. <laughs> so here's a 13.8 volt on Amazon, 16 amp audio tech. Well, that sounds okay. All right. So I bought this power supply. I, I bought it not for my ham gear, thank God. I bought it for a security system that I had at my old house. Uh, I wanted to power the cameras for the security system, but I didn't want to use those wall wart power supplies because they generate radio frequency noise. So I thought, I'm going to get a, a big power supply, just power them all with this, and it'll be all okay. And it was all okay for about three weeks. And then poof! All my stuff was uh, destroyed because the regulator in this cheap Chinese power supply went bad. And instead of getting 13.8 volts out, I got 21 volts out. And my equipment did not like that. So don't go by ratings alone. 
Ask people um, as, as to what kind of power supply should I get? What do you like? Astron, made in America, excellent power supplies. They make both switching and linear power supplies. Uh, so highly recommended. But don't get cheap Chinese power supplies. Learn from my mistake. Another source that some people will use are car batteries or other uh, um, DC batteries. Um, nominal 13.8 volts when charging, so that's where that number came from. Um, these car batteries will charge from a vehicle alternator, but remember that when you're charging uh, these batteries, they'll release hydrogen gas. And hydrogen gas that must be vented. Otherwise, if you charge too fast in a, an enclosed area, you can have a release of explosive gases, hydrogen, and you can actually have a, a fire hazard or explosion hazard with lead acid batteries. In a car, there are various sources of noise, especially if you're running amplitude modulated signals, single sideband uh, in your car, you're going to hear them. Uh, you're going to have alternator whine. You're going to have spark plug popping noises. You might have intermittent noise uh, because uh, the panels of the car are not properly grounded or bonded together. Um, you can have improper radio power connections. The 12 volt negative used to be you could connect it to the vehicle chassis. Don't do that anymore. Better is to take everything all the way back to the battery, both the positive and the negative supplies for your radio. That way you know you'll get um, uh, power to the radio without um, noise or voltage drops across the panels in the car. Um, and also in, in some cars, including my uh, uh, Chevy Avalanche, uh, they have a, a, a clamp on the battery negative uh, that uh, is monitoring current. Uh, in the car and goes to the computer. Uh, so you want to make sure there that you connect your radio negative to the engine compartment grounding strap so that the radio's current can be monitored in there as well. So uh, just a, a little thing. But you want to take it back to the battery. That's the point. There are some batteries that are rechargeable and some that are not. Um, what does it say replaceable? I meant rechargeable, but okay. Um, alkaline batteries, you can't recharge. Carbon zinc batteries, you cannot recharge. Nickel cadmium, yes, okay. Um, uh, lithium and lithium ion, yes. Uh, lithium ion rechargeable, lithium disposable, no. So um, there is a chart here uh, that tells you about batteries and what can be recharged. These are the, the popular ones right now, uh, the lithium iron phosphate batteries. Uh, they require a specific kind of battery charger. So if you're going to buy one of these, um, make sure you buy the, the appropriate charger for it as well. They're great because they're not heavy like lead-acid batteries. They're relatively lightweight, but they have a, a large capacity. Here's 100 amp hours. Uh, and uh, so the runtime uh, on one of these batteries is calculated uh, using this uh, amp hour rating, amp hours divided by the average current uh, being used by the radio is going to give you your runtime from these batteries. Uh, very uh, interesting. Uh, but again, by quality, there's Chinese knockoffs of these, which some are good, some are not so good. Um, BioNO is a, a popular a brand uh, that is used in the amateur radio community. Generators versus inverters. Should I get a big battery and an inverter to, to generate 120 volts, or should I have a, a generator? Um, some generators, like this older type, have issues of voltage and frequency regulation. Some generators now have inverters on their output uh, and, and, and make a pure sine wave output. So uh, it, it's just, you know, it's up to you whether you want to go one way or the other. But the thing you need to know is how big of an inverter or how big of a generator do you need? And you need to take into mind, you know, your out, RF output stage. Uh, are you using a 100 watt radio? Uh, how much current does it uh, draw? That's going to be the, the biggest power user. Uh, for the receiver, just on standby, how much current is it going to be drawing? Uh, and um, all other factors like cooling, efficiency, inrush currents uh, for the power supply and uh, for the generator. Keep in mind that not only do you need to size the generator, you need to size the cable. 
your goal is to have a sufficiently large cable so that you don't have voltage drop in the cable coming from your power supply or your generator. And so here's the various American wire gauge thicknesses, and they'll tell you uh, the ohms per 1,000 volts, uh, the, the maximum amps for chassis wiring. Um, your goal is to, to minimize voltage drop. Oh, questions already? So which of the following is an appropriate power supply rating for a typical 50-watt output mobile FM transceiver? Delta B? Yeah, I said 15 amps. So they're saying 12 amps, so 13.8 at 12 amps. I, I would go with the 15, but okay, that's, that's their answer. Why are short heavy gauge wires used for a transceiver's DC power connection? Alpha. Alpha. Yeah, to minimize mm. voltage drop. And how can you determine the length of time that equipment can be powered from a battery? Bravo. Bravo. Yeah, divide the battery's ampere hour rating by the average current drawn by the equipment. And where should the negative power return of a mobile transceiver be connected? Alpha. Alpha. Yeah, at the 12 volt battery chassis ground point, yes. And which of the following battery chemistries is rechargeable? All of those. All of these can be recharged, indeed. And which of the following is not rechargeable? B. Carbon zinc, the old uh, flashlight battery, yep. And what type of circuit controls the amount of voltage from a power supply? Alpha. That's a regulator, a voltage regulator, to maintain the 13.8 volts, for example. And what hazard is caused by charging or discharging a battery too quickly? Alpha. Overheating or outgassing, yep. And that is the end of chapter five. What I'd like to do now, though, is to show you uh, in the time remaining, I'm going to get you out early tonight, uh, three websites uh, that I think you should know about. The first is the American Radio Relay League's website, uh, and uh, second is another hamstudy.org that you might be able to utilize in studying for your test. And then finally, the last one is just for fun, uh, qrz.com. So let me close out of here. And uh, let's uh, start first with the American Radio Relay League uh, exam review site. So it's uh, A-R-R-L examreview.appspot.com. Uh, and it, hopefully you've already signed up for a, a free uh, uh, account here at, at the website. You can kind of scroll down and you can see this is the, the main page. Uh, you can sign up in three easy steps. It's free. You don't have to pay any money. They do want your email address just so that uh, that's part of your login. Well, let's go ahead and log in. There's mine. All right, and you can do three things here. Um, well, you can buy a book if you want to buy a book. Uh, but you can review for exam. You can take a practice uh, exam. Or you can print a practice exam. Probably don't want to do the last, but maybe you do. But review for an exam, if we click on that, we're technician, we're looking for the technician class. So here we have the, the most recent question pool from 2022 to 2026, so that's the one, technician review. And what I like about this is review by chapter. So we just completed chapter five. You can go and select everything, but you probably don't want to do that. But you can go and select all for Chapter 2, for example. All right? And review. And you will see the amateur uh, radio exam questions from Chapter 2 here. What type of amateur station simultaneously retransmits the signal of another amateur station on a different channel or channels? What do you think that is? Uh, C. That's C. That's a repeater. And so when you click on it and you get the right answer, it turns green, and you can go ahead to the next question. I'm going to get this wrong. So what is the velocity of a radio wave traveling through free space? Well, we know it's the speed of light. 
but if I say speed of sound, look what happens. Oh, it goes red, it marks an X there, and it shows me what the right answer is. So uh, also gives you here the page in our book where you can read more about this particular question. So I think this is a, a great site uh, for reviewing. You can review by chapter, uh, you can review all the test questions, and uh, the thing that uh, Jeremy mentioned earlier that I linked to Learning How to Learn, the presentation that Dave Ivey gave uh, to our extra class, uh, and uh, I'll send that link out to you again probably next week. Um, repetition, repeating, going back over the material is a key so that you don't forget it. Because we, after a day or so, we lose about 80% of the information we heard in a lecture, for example. So that's just human. Uh, that's what we do. So we have to work against that. And spaced repetition uh, is, is a great way to, to do that. And taking uh, practice tests or reviews like this is a good one. So, so this is the American Radio Relay League site. Uh, another site uh, is hamstudy.org. Uh, and I, I've not really talked about this uh, at all. Again, here we are in the technician class page. Uh, and here again, the, the question pool. Okay, it's the right question pool. Uh, so that's the one we want. And you can go into study mode, for example, here. Uh, and it will actually you know, give you the questions again. Uh, what device increases the transmitted output power from a transceiver? We covered that tonight. What do you think? See. That's an RF power amplifier. All right. Good. We can go on to the next one. And so, and it's got, you can look at explanations. It keeps track of your scores. Uh, so this is hamstudy.org. This is the same site that I sent you to, uh, to look for uh, sessions in your area. Hamstudy.org stroke sessions. So, so highly recommended. Finally, the last one uh, we'll talk about tonight is a fun one. It's qrz.com. You may not get all access to all of the features of the site until you get your license. But um, once you get your license, you will have a web page on this site. Uh, so if, uh, we, for example, type in my call sign. Oh, there I am. There's my old station. I miss it. That's where I was operating at the, at the old station. And it's a little background that I put in there, a little bio, uh, biography about um, where I am, what I'm doing, et cetera, et cetera. And you can look up not only US stations, you can look up DX stations. Uh, so here's uh, my friend Carlos, TI2 Coca-Cola. You'll hear him on the air. And um, the interesting thing here is, um, uh, and this was, uh, prompted from a, an email I got in the, in the extra class, uh, uh, QSLing. You can find out all the instructions on how to get a confirmation from him. Um, he QSLs via direct only. He does not use international reply coupons, which are not sold anymore. Three green stamps are required, three dollar bills. Send him three dollar bills, US dollars. Uh, can't use U.S. stamps. The U.S. stamps are not valid in Costa Rica. <laughs> so this is Carlos. This is his station. More information about him. QRZ.com. It's kind of a fun uh, place to go uh, for amateur radio. So that's all I've got for you tonight. Uh, are there any questions about anything we've covered tonight or in the previous weeks? All right. If not, I'll say 73. Uh, if you're in the Florida area, going to be at Hamcation this weekend, a big ham fest uh, at the Orlando Fairgrounds. Uh, maybe not this year for you all, but maybe next year. Think about it. Put it on your calendar. February. Until then, 73. See you next week. And uh, good DX.